Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you. Uh, welcome to our SAGES webinar on lessons from COVID, uh, how we live and thrive as surgeons. I'd just like to give you a little bit of background introduction uh, to, this, to this topic today. Um, uh, just a small introduction. Um, as you know, uh, this pandemic has, uh, has caused many tragedies and had a big impact on everybody and their everyday uh, practice and their everyday lives. Um, but at SAGES, we have, a new, uh, uh, we have a great new task force under the le leadership of our president, Horacio Asbun, uh, called Reimagining the Practice of Surgery. He's going to talk to us a little bit about that. And we really want to look at the flip side of burnout. Um, we want to talk about more about thriving in surgery, remembering why we went into surgery in the first place, uh, finding all those elements that allow us to reach our full growth potential and to thrive. Uh, and in that first task force meeting, we began to, just in talking to the, to the members of the group, began to emerge that there's some really important lessons that uh, people are starting to take away from uh, their experiences in, in, in COVID uh, uh, with, all the, uh, with, all the, with all the tragedies and with all the challenges. Uh, there are some really important opportunities and some lessons for everybody uh, that I think may have, uh, we're going to hear today, uh, may have a, a really important impact on how we practice surgery and how we live as surgeons. Um, we have a really great panel put together today, uh, some amazing thought leaders and people, uh, surgeons, uh, SAGES members, SAGES leaders uh, for you. Unfortunately, uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Alsady, had uh, has a, uh, a crisis at work today and uh, unfortunately is going to uh, be unable to join us. That will leave us a nice amount of time for, for discussion. Uh, so we will close out a little bit earlier, 8.15 rather than 8.30. Um, but before, uh, before we get all these wonderful speakers uh, and to begin this webinar, I'd like to introduce our president, uh, Horacio Asbin. This is his uh, brainchild. Uh, and then uh, we'll go to Dr. Bittner uh, for some of the housekeeping. Horacio. Good evening. Um, the, thank you, Leanne. Uh, this is the fourth webinar um, that we're doing from SAGES about COVID. Um, the first three have been uh, very well attended and we have received a lot of feedback and I have no doubt that it's gonna be the same with this one. We not only have a superb group of panelists, but also the subject is a little different this time, right? I mean, who would think that we're going to get something good out of this darn crisis? Well, there is. And um, hopefully we will be able to see what lessons we can learn from it and what can we apply to our practice. And this goes along with what Leanne was saying. Over the last decades, I would say, Throughout my career, I've been hearing on the lounge how many surgeons complain about how bad we have it and how more and more we have lost control. And then you start looking at, at, at your surroundings and you see it's sad because what we do is so, so enriching. We're very lucky. We work with our hands, we help, we help people. And uh, at, at the same time, we're supposed to be having fun. But with the changes that have happened in surgery over the last several years, we now hear about burnout. Many of us carry the load on, and if you don't want to call it burnout, you can call it whatever it is. And then we have to stop it, right? At some point we need to say, okay, what is what brought us to surgery? As Leanne was saying, let's find the joy in practicing surgery. Because of that, we decided to um, create this task force. And I was very fortunate uh, to have Leanne lead it and at the same time very fortunate to have a lot of passionate people as part of the committee and you would have heard that the first meeting was was pretty pretty um the, the task force i should say the first meeting was pretty encouraging and then uh, tonight um even though it's not the core subject of uh, bringing joy back to surgery but it's on the same lines how do we get uh, something good out of a really horrible and bad situation then uh, without any further ado, I just want to um, pass again the baton to Leanne um, to uh, continue introducing the speakers. And um, actually Dr. Bittner is supposed to talk next. Then if you don't mind, Leanne, I'll skip you and I'll give it to Dr. Bittner. Thank you for that, Horacio. And 
and I, I'm, I like to have fun and I love the concept of this task force and I was um, really excited to be invited and I'm, I'm privileged to be here. So I, I very much appreciate that. I have just a few a bit of housekeeping and then I'm gonna introduce the speakers before we get started. Um, first, uh, by way of disclosures, here are the disclosures which are not germane to our presentations this evening. This is the accreditation statement. Uh, this can be viewed for uh, continuing medical education um, based on uh, category one credits as you see here. Um, the person who registered for this activity will receive an email with a link uh, that link to the webinar and you'll have to answer a few questions in order to claim your CME credits that will follow the webinar. The objectives really today uh, as Horacio outlined is to discuss ways that innovative leadership at various levels whether you're the president of a hospital or leading uh, a team of surgeons may help transform the practice of surgery to promote a healthier approach to our life and our work bringing the joy back right and also implementing changes in our lives um, that can facilitate our practice and our wellness. So we're gonna hear from some panelists about those topics today. Um, the first talk is gonna be called Lessons About Surgical Practice from COVID-19. And because I probably now have COVID-19, I also can't spell COVID-19, as you can see on the slide. But um, our first speaker is John Romanelli, who's a professor of surgery at UMass in Bay State as well as leads their weight loss surgery program and their MIS fellowship. And one of the things that I love about him and I think uh, embodies what we're here to talk about, uh, you'll see in these hashtags that follow each presenter. And you know, he, he always represents rekindling his passion. He's, he's an excellent musician. We get to see it at things like Sages and he is very passionate about it. And, and bringing that to surgery is something that's always exciting. The next talk is gonna be called Challenges and Opportunities for Telehealth uh, with Denise Gee, who's an assistant professor at Harvard um, and helps run the program uh, for general surgery residency and direct the simulation lab at Mass General. And this is a picture of her lovely family. And she has talks as well as podcasts about striving for a work-life balance. And uh, you know, I think that's something that we all can learn from. The third talk will be what motivates how we work, teach, and learn. Um, this is from my mentor, John Mellinger, who's the J. Roland Falls Endowed Professor of Surgery and Vice Chair at Southern Illinois University. Um, and you can see from this family photo here, and much like I've had experiences with him, one of the things I cherish is that he's a good example of seeking joy in all that we do, whether that's your family or whether that's your work or whether that's surgery at large. And I think that's a good lesson that we can all take home. And finally, although we're missing him tonight, um, Dr. Adnan al was gonna talk about innovative leadership to support a paradigm shift. Um, and he is a great adventurer and really truly embraces experience, whether it be snow skiing or, or other high impact sports. And I think that's a useful thing for all of us as well. So with that being said, um, I would like to go ahead and have our first speaker, Dr. Romanelli get started. Thank, thank you for that nice um, introduction. I, I much appreciate the opportunity to uh, give the talk tonight. And uh, I was asked to, to think about lessons that we could have learned about surgical practice uh, from COVID-19. But I wanted to start with where were we with regards to surgeon wellness? Um, we, we hear a lot about burnout and we hear the term used loosely. It, it hasn't been well-defined. Um, and we really don't know the scope of, of what we're dealing with. But in January, there was a survey released by Medscape that they do every five years that assesses a wide variety of physicians about how they're doing from a wellness standpoint. And in this survey, 35% of the general surgeons that were, were surveyed reported that they are burned out, one in three. And that's actually better than the average of all physicians that responded to the survey, which was a shocking 42%. And, and I guess the silver lining to this black cloud is that's an improvement from five years ago when it was 
So this is a significant problem across the entire spectrum of clinical medicine. And as you see, if you break it into groups by, by generation, it's the mid-career people that are, the, the, like myself, the, the, the Gen Xers out there that are, are, are burned out the most 48%, nearly half of the workforce in mid-career is feeling burned out. A little bit less for millennials and a little bit less for baby boomers. And there are multiple causes from this, no surprise, but bureaucratic non-clinical tasks more than 55% pointed to that as a cause for, for non-wellness or for feeling burned out. Uh, long work hours is clearly a contributor. Lack of respect from administration and colleagues, that number surprised me at 32%, very high. Uh, the, the thing we hear the most about and you see literature about is electronic medical records. That was only fourth on the list of priorities, which just goes to tell you that we may not have our eyes on the right target. Uh, compensation is, is a negative driver for some, and certainly lack of control or autonomy, uh, also significant causes of feeling burned out. Uh, the same survey looked into coping mechanisms, what physicians did to handle these feelings of negativity. And I think the leader here, at the top of the list is very appropriate given what we've all gone through with the pandemic, but people choose to isolate, which I'm not sure is psychologically healthy, but clearly ironic given this period of self-isolation and quarantine from the pandemic, 45%. But there's some good news here as many of these coping mechanisms are actually quite healthy. 45% turn to exercise. 42% uh, talk about their issues with family and friends. 40% try to get more rest and sleep. Um, now there's some negative things like eating junk food and you can see the list. I don't need to read it all to you. Alcohol use is actually fairly high. Uh, but I guess my silver lining from this is very few reported smoking cigarettes, using marijuana or, or abusing prescription medications. Um, so thankfully that's a very low number, but nonetheless, we have a wide variety of, of coping mechanisms. Now there are a, a, a few definitions of burnout out there. And I thought uh, to try to give an erudite talk, I'd give my own, but I wanted to start with the one that's most frequently cited and that's Maslach's from 1993. And it's the triad of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization and reduced personal accomplishment. So when we're overextended, we tend to get emotionally exhausted. Um, we begin to depersonalize, we, we get negative or, or callous or detached responses to others. Uh, and we begin to feel like we're not competent or, or we're not uh, proud of the achievement in our own work. So these are all together, this triad is, is the physician in trouble. Um, I like to simplify it and say this, burnout is the end stage of a failure of wellness. It is the extreme pejorative end on a spectrum of mental well-being. It's our job to move away from the pejorative end and find the joy in surgery, as Dr. Asman said at the beginning of this webinar, our job is to push ourselves away from the burnout end of that spectrum. Um, this is a long uh, quote, and I apologize for that, but this was just published last November in the Clinics of Colorectal Surgery, where it describes wellness as a multidimensional commitment that encompasses occupational, mental, physical, emotional, and social domains. But burnout tends to come from things like loss of control and autonomy and flexibility, from inefficient processes, from disjointed or, or dysfunctional workplace relationships or goals that are not in alignment, from excessive administrative burden, from poor work-life balance, which we'll hear Denise talk about in a little bit, uh, and certainly frustrations with electronic medical record systems. So this is a, a, a new paper that just came out that really looks at this issue quite nicely. Um, there's also data that was published in the Annals of Surgery a little over 10 years ago that look at factors that lead to an increase in burnout. Um, having young children and the pressure of being both a parent and a physician. Um, having a purely incentive-based pay or being on a, a productivity system, um, the, the so-called eat what you can kill system. Uh, having a spouse that's also a healthcare professional, trying to juggle two physician, uh, a two-physician marriage and family responsibilities can be very difficult. Um, and increases in call responsibilities or work hours, and then increasing years in practice. Uh, the longer we work, the harder we work, the, the more risk we are at burnout. 
but interestingly protective against burnout paradoxically paradoxically was having children with the implication of a healthy family life may protect against burnout um, increased age which goes against what it said for increasing years in practice and then having greater than 50 percent of the time protected for research and administrative tasks and i'm sure we all want that and very few of us can have it so i raise the question of is the decline in surge in wellness an acute on chronic disease there's ample evidence this problem starts in residency and even in some cases in medical school um, acute negative incidents that impact our careers push us in the negative direction on that wellness spectrum uh, this came out two years ago but it was a survey of over 3,000 pgy2 residents of all specialties 45 percent reported burnout that's nearly half our trainees. This is a big concern. 14%, one in seven expressed regret in their career choice. And you can see that there are certain specialties, general surgery being one of them, that was highlighted as having a higher rate of burnout symptoms during the PGY2 year. And this is the most distressing thing. One in seven definitely not or probably would not choose to become a physician again. So I feel that this spectrum of wellness changes based on the events in our career and it's every time we get into burnout type situations it's an acute flare-up of a chronic disease of poor wellness resident burnout is a big problem 69 percent of residents this is surgical residents tested positive for burnout on at least one subscale and that's from 2016. and it raises the question of is there a cumulative emotional toll um, this quote about resident burnout the trauma we witness piles up on us while some of the trauma is unavoidable, including tragedies like newborn deaths, they happen for reasons we'll never understand. But however meaningful it will be to accompany patients through this, it takes an emotional toll on us. So perhaps the, the, the summation of that emotional toll begins to push us in the wrong direction on the wellness spectrum. So now the pandemic hits. So let's take that as a backdrop and COVID-19 happens. And it leads to a cessation in elective surgery across much of North America and for that matter, throughout much of the world. Many surgeons were suddenly tasked with covering different services. Some actually became temporary critical care physicians. Some got tasked to cover emergency room shifts. Some got tasked to cover the trauma service or the emergency general surgery service while those surgeons were tasked to cover COVID-19 units. There was an almost complete loss of operating room volume. Our elective practices shut down, and this created financial hardship for surgeons. And let's not forget, especially their staffs, who, who were far less equipped to handle a financial hit like this. So what were some of the ramifications? Well, clearly a loss of productivity and income. Now we have a backlog of patients that are waiting to be operated on. Uh, we are seeing, and I don't know if some of the participants are seeing this, but certainly in our center, increasing severity of disease in the patients who waited too long to seek care. We saw more perforated appendixes, we're seeing more gangrenous gallbladders, we're seeing an increase in amputations that are presenting rather than critical limb ischemia. Uh, administrative expectations are that surgery will save the day and recoup the lost income of the, the shutdown period. But how are we going to do that? Are we going to have longer elective operating hours? Are we going to do elective cases on the weekends? Um, and then there are, I think, unrealistic expectations that when the ban on elective surgery is lifted, that patient volume will immediately return to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, I think that's a big assumption given that we're in the middle of a pandemic. We don't know that patients are going to be comfortable seeking elective health care. So SAGES put together a primer for taking care of yourself during and after this crisis. And this was just published last month uh, on the SAGES website and this month in surgical endoscopy. And we looked at some things like the emotional toll of the situation, the fear of inadvertently transmitting the virus to family members, concerns regarding being redeployed to an area where you don't typically practice clinically, concerns for personal and family safety during the redeployment, financial hardship, and how to safely re-enter our practice post-pandemic. We talked about vulnerable persons. We raised concerns about with more people staying at home, an increase in domestic abuse and alcohol and substance abuse during the isolation period. We looked at the actual ramifications of social isolation, and we certainly looked at promoting wellness. We did look at the emotional toll of the pandemic. 
Um, we looked at things like what happens if you have to self-isolate in your own home. I know stories of surgeons living in their basements and they can't see their children in their own house because they're working in a COVID-19 unit and they're fearful transmitting the disease to their family. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, we were really worried about appropriate levels of personal protective equipment. I think now it's more a matter of knowing what personal protective equipment is required. Whether or not a patient is known to be COVID-19 negative or not determines what type of PPE we need to wear. But we made recommendations too, which is to use the time to maintain a routine, pick up a hobby. You saw in JB's picture that he showed that I like to play the guitar. I've been playing a lot of it during this downtime. Remain socially connected via video calling. We have technology to remain connected. The term social isolation was a bad one. It is, it is uh, in-person isolation, but we should remain socially connected. Uh, we talked about in the primer concerns about the clinical redeployment, anxiety of the unknown, uh, fear of inadequate expertise or oversight. What if I'm stuck having to manage a very sick trauma patient and I haven't done trauma in 20 years? How am I gonna deliver appropriate care to that patient? We worried about care rationing. What happens if we run out of ventilators or we run out of personal protective equipment? How do we care for our patients? We worried about the frequency of deployment. But the one thing we recommended is to be flexible, be open-minded about how you can help, adapt to the needs of the redeployment, and understand it's not permanent, it's a closed-ended situation. Many people are already returning to their clinical practices, and it might have been a shorter redeployment than we originally thought it would be. Um, there's certainly family concerns during redeployment periods. Um, they might be worried about getting adequate personal protective equipment to be protected from you. Um, they might need to be isolated. And then there's the question of when can all that stop in your own home? But we did make some good recommendations in the Sages Primer, and I urge you to look at it in more detail. Maintain those family connections. Wear face masks in your own home, but see each other. Do parallel activities apart. Go for a walk outside, but stay six feet away from your family. Watch your children play on a playground from afar. Um, some surgeons move their families to other family members so that they could be alone in their homes. And of course, now that COVID-19 testing is a little more available, you can self-test for reassurance that you don't have a disease you can spread. Uh, financial hardship is, is a real uh, big emotional toll on many people. Um, it's worse for our colleagues than it is for us, and we need to remember that. Many practices had to furlough their employees. Our staffs are not getting paid. Uh, in my practice, we had to redeploy our nursing staff to other places in the hospital to help test for COVID-19. They've been taken away from their jobs and their routines. Um, private practices could be earning no income whatsoever, so they're hit even harder. Um, now, during this period, you certainly still can perform urgent or non-elective cases, and the recommendation is to do that. Get those painful biliary colic gallbladders done. Get those chronically incarcerated hernias done, because when we ramp up again with elective surgery volume, we're going to be competing for OR time to get those cases finished. Um, maintain relationships with patients, especially in the bariatric world, using video or telehealth technology, uh, especially for those awaiting surgical care. Stay connected to your patients. You need a strategy on how to restart. We're coming near to that point where we can begin re-entering elective surgical practice. Um, but understand this, patients may be afraid to come to the hospital. In my practice, we called 60 patients on a bump list who were waiting to have non-elective cases. These you know, things like hernias, gallbladders, incisional hernias, parasophageal hernias, three out of 60 were willing to have their surgery now. So patients are gonna be afraid to come back even when we're ready to practice. So we need strategies to make the patients understand, make the public understand it's safe to come to the hospital. Um, hospitals may change the way they give out operative time. They may suspend or reduce block operating time to prioritize higher revenue generating cases. Hospitals are hemorrhaging money. So whatever produces the most income is gonna have a, a measure of importance. Um, in my institution, orthopedics generates a lot of income. So should they get disproportionate amounts of OR time to help the hospital's overall bottom line? These are questions that we need to start asking now. And how do you reschedule cases? Do you do it by acuity? Do you do it by the order they were canceled? Or, or do you use some other methodology to try to fairly reschedule your patients that got disrupted by the pandemic? And then what about our referring providers? Are they seeing patients? Are the primary care physicians still seeing patients? Because if the stream into your practice has shut off, 
once you clear your backlog, you're going to be back to a downtime period. So we need to start working on getting the referring providers to start seeing patients again so that we have patients to continue to operate on. There's been mostly a negative connotation in my talk, and, and I don't mean for that to be the case. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the new strategic vision for our society is reimagining surgical care for a healthier world. Well, you know, maybe for the only time in our careers, we have been given a giant reset button. Uh, this is the one chance we'll get to reset surgery. You know, when you want to make changes at your institution, it can be very hard to implement because the operating room is a machine that just keeps functioning no matter what. But maybe now is the opportunity to work on local barriers to change with the operating room capacity less, you can do things to try to drive disruptive, desirable local changes to your, at your institution. And maybe innovation can save us. I don't want to steal Denise's thunder, but I do think a permanent change from the pandemic will be the continued emergence of telehealth and video telehealth. And now we actually get reimbursed for it. Maybe this can enable us to increase our volumes or make us efficient in other ways to give us time for things like research or administrative tasks, or for that matter, non-work related activities. Um, it, I also think it should cause a rethinking in how often we need to see patients in the office postoperatively. For routine things, maybe it's completely unnecessary. The early returns on my end are patients seem to like it. They have to travel less. It's less disruption to their work day. They don't have to pay a copay in many cases. So, so far it seems to be positive, but we'll hear more detail about that in the next talk. So what are some lessons learned? Getting more rest matters. I've been sleeping one to two hours a night more than I typically had during my work week. I have not felt this refreshed in many years. Um, you know, we've heard all about the quarantine 15, but notice the minus between the word quarantine and 15. It means to lose 15 pounds, not gain it. Now is the time to do adequate amounts of exercise. We never have time to exercise. You do now. Eat right. Don't eat bad foods and junk foods and quick foods. Eat healthy. Don't abuse alcohol. Don't abuse drugs. In other words, do the opposite of what many of our patients are doing during the, the, the pandemic. And then ask yourself this question. Was it worth it to me personally to be as productive as I was? Now, I'm sure our, our, our bosses and our chairs and our chiefs will say, well, yeah, but it really depends on your compensation model and really what your career goals are. Busy practices are gonna be busy. If you have a busy practice, it's hard to not be busy. There's that pressure to get patients taken care of, but it also depends on what your internal drivers of personal productivity and accomplishment are. Ask yourself the question, should I be working as hard as I did? Maybe that's why we weren't feeling so well. And also know this, we can still be productive members of a medical community despite not doing elective surgery. I served on numerous hospital committees related to the pandemic. I got some research done with several new projects that are brewing. I got completely caught up with administrative tasks that have been out there for months. And I did some urgent cases. And you know what? I re-engaged with my family and it has been invaluable. I love these two quotes, one of them from a surgeon from Stanford who said, You'll, your children will never read a single research paper that you publish. And my former chairman, Richard Waite, used to say, none of your children will care how long your CV is. So maybe now we re-engage with our family. Our out of the hospital time should be exactly that, out of the hospital. So final thoughts, this massive disruption has provided ample time for introspection. Please take advantage of it if you haven't. It's often small things that add up over time, the old death by a thousand cuts that detract from our wellness. So let's gain some perspective about what's really important. As long as we have our health, our family and gainful employment and an intrinsic love and joy from operating and from performing surgery, we have to learn not to let the drivers of dissatisfaction move us towards that negative end on the wellness spectrum. We need to work smarter, not harder. So maybe for example, telehealth visits during operating room turnaround time in exchange for a half an afternoon off a week. And lastly, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Thank you very much. We'll hold questions for the very end and uh, we will move on to Denise's talk, which I can't wait to hear. That's okay, John, thank you so much. I appreciate it, especially, um, you know, talking to me about my COVID positive 15, unfortunately. And, and you're, you're absolutely right, just to bring out the point of joy that you brought forth at the end, is that my daughter wants to be a writer and, and she has all these lists of writers that she knows. And I said, you know, your dad has written a book chapter or two and she was not only unimpressed, but she gave me a, that's nice dad. 
and moved on. So you're absolutely right in saying that, you know, fully engaging with, with your family is an excellent way um, to address things like burnout. So moving on, um, next is Denise Gee. And before we turn it over to her, I just want to let everyone know that is on the webinar, you can submit questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of Zoom. We will review all those questions and try to get to as many of them as we can during the Q&A session. So with that, Denise, you want to take it away? Got it. All right, let me share my screen. Great, can you guys see it? Great. Okay. Um, so thank you to Sages for the opportunity to speak today uh, on the challenges and opportunities of telehealth, especially in the context of this COVID pandemic. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. I have no disclosures. Uh, so telehealth has been around for a very long time, but it never gained widespread adoption until now. So today I wanted to take an opportunity to look a little more closely at the evolution of telehealth over time, and especially more recently in the midst of a COVID crisis. We're all aware of the many advantages of telehealth. First, it offers convenience. Patients and physicians can connect despite multiple competing responsibilities on their respective schedules. And it makes it easier for patients who are homebound, unable to travel, or who can't take time off of work. This can potentially decrease the risk of no-shows and cancellations as well, which brings us to our next point, cost savings. Telehealth potentially saves both time and dollars. It can eliminate travel time and expenses, especially for patients who live in rural communities, and it reduces the wait time for patients to be seen. We've all had this scenario where a patient drives over an hour through traffic to get into the city, pay for parking, sit in our waiting rooms, only to be told that we're delayed for their visit for what is ultimately a short 10 minute visit. Telehealth offers easier patient access to physicians and providers in general and allows for second opinions as needed. It can provide rapid access to subspecialists who are not immediately available in person or who are not necessarily part of a patient's network. And finally, telehealth offers a safe alternative. As has been evident in this pandemic, staying home is generally safer for multiple reasons and minimizes exposure risk in all directions. While the COVID pandemic will eventually pass, infectious diseases like the influenza virus will continue to be a recurrent concern. The overall increased efficiency, lower costs, and ability to provide patients better access to healthcare seems to be a winning proposition. But there are certainly inherent limitations to telehealth as well. First, Patients need access to the internet and to the technology. Truly comprehensive telehealth requires a fast connection and a steady signal. Currently, 35 million patients in the United States do not even have access to broadband internet, and many do not own a smartphone. Furthermore, in order to use telehealth appropriately, a minimum level of tech literacy is required that not all patients possess. Which brings us to technology. One of the very reasons for telehealth success is also one of its limitations. Problems with connectivity and other technological glitches continue to threaten its widespread use. Human connection. Medicine has traditionally been built upon human connection where physicians are able to demonstrate empathy and compassion and have the ability to read nonverbal cues. Telehealth limits this physical interaction with patients. In addition, the inability to perform a physical exam is a concern in scenarios where a physician must diagnose a heart murmur, evaluate a breast mass, or drain an abscess collection. And finally, labs, x-rays, and other ancillary services, at least for the moment, are not readily available to all patients via telehealth and generally require additional travel to some type of healthcare facility. Prior to COVID, there were also a number of equally troublesome barriers to implementation. Many patients were simply unaware that telehealth options were available to them. Some assumed it would be ex expensive and only reserved for concierge care. 
and others did not know whether it was covered in their healthcare plan or did not know the exact steps required for them to access their providers electronically. Even the ones who wanted to give it a shot were often faced with systems that were glitchy or had to go through many tedious steps before being able to access their physician. In order to build telehealth infrastructure, infrastructure appropriately, healthcare systems would require a great deal of training, purchase new equipment, restructure, or in some instances, completely overhaul their IT services. And many were not ready to invest in all of that when the status quo seemed to be working just fine. Furthermore, implementing telehealth on a grander scale required a change in culture and a shift in mentality, which was difficult to do with many physicians and patients resistant to the idea and unwilling to work past the learning curve. And finally, there was lack of reimbursement. Physicians really had no incentive to perform virtual visits because health insurers either didn't cover or paid far less than the prices of face-to-face in-person visits. But this all changed in March of 2020, when a global crisis forced healthcare institutions and regulatory bodies to turn to alternative ways of providing healthcare in order to limit exposure to the novel coronavirus. And then all of a sudden, the barriers got smaller. The CDC and the WHO began actively advocating telehealth in order to monitor patients and reduce the risk of virus spread. In a matter of days to weeks, patient awareness of the existence of telehealth was no longer an issue. Doubtful patients had no other choice. Patients with and without COVID had to be monitored virtually in order to limit the spread of disease. Healthcare systems rushed to ready their providers and staff to bring their infrastructure up to speed and be prepared to deliver telehealth to patients quickly, safely, and effectively. While resistance to change was still present amongst providers, the train was leaving the station and it was difficult not to jump on. And arguably long overdue, age-old regulations and restrictions on telehealth reimbursement began to be lifted. As part of its emergency COVID-19 authorization, Congress rolled back regulations that prevented members from using telehealth and lifted provision, provisions that up until now uh, limited telehealth services to rural areas. Virtual visits by video and subsequently phone became reimbursable through Medicare and through most supplemental insurers. During the emergency, stringent rules regarding HIPAA compliance were also lifted so that private communication technologies could be utilized and former requirements that patients and providers had to be in the same state were loosened as well. As a result, telehealth visits have skyrocketed since the last few weeks of March. Healthcare has notoriously been slow in adapting to new technologies. For better or worse, it took a global pandemic to finally accelerate our progress in this arena. The question is whether the progress we've made is merely temporary or instead a foundation for the future. I'd argue that we've come so far, we really cannot turn back. So we reviewed the advantages and limitations of telehealth as we know it today, largely video visits between doctors and patients, but it has the potential to be so much more. What does the future of telehealth look like and what's on the horizon? I encourage you all to read two interesting perspective pieces on this topic. The first is a New England Journal article published on April 2nd that is somewhat of a call to arms to physicians who are in the midst of what the authors coin as healthcare's digital revolution. The second is an article in The Economist by Dr. Eric Topol that describes the essential aspects of telehealth that are most likely to last even after the COVID pandemic and how we physicians can incorporate it in our care of patients. I'd like to end today by looking towards the horizon and considering what telehealth opportunities exist as we move past COVID and into the future. The time to use our collective physician voices is now. It is unclear what federal, state, or private insurer regulations will be after the pandemic, highlighting the need for physicians to have a seat at the table when these decisions are being made. Patients should continue to have access to telehealth services, and these should continue to be reimbursed at the same rate as in-person visits. In fact, we should advocate for payment structures that go beyond just video visits and include the use of wearable devices, mobile sensors, 
or creative applications of voice interface systems. We should also start thinking about the role telehealth can play in the design of a bigger system of integrated healthcare, leveraging the use of telehealth apps, connected devices, and remote monitoring services to deliver better care. For example, care coordination currently can be very personnel intensive, but telehealth offers opportunities where we can automate certain processes. Let's put this in terms of surgery. For bariatric centers, electronic outreach programs can be developed to stay in touch with patients, remind them to log physical activity, and advocate healthy lifestyle changes. Imagine a post-operative patient who has not exercised in a week. What if that data capture could automatically alert someone at your office to contact them and offer support earlier than at their one-year visit with you when they've passed their window of maximal weight loss? Telehealth should also be used to expand services to patients who are chronically ill at home. Hospital at home models already exist, but telehealth can better integrate them into the health system. Visits can then more easily involve family members and caregivers and a sense of the home environment so that providers have a better understanding of potential barriers to optimal care. As we're thinking of creative ways to use existing technology, we should undoubtedly explore new technologies and consider the use of artificial intelligence as well. AI holds a great deal of promise as it can be applied to patient data sets to look for patterns and immediately alert physicians of alarming trends. Thus, instead of being reactionary, telehealth can help us be proactive in our patient care. Ultimately, we want these, advantage, these advances to improve efficiency, deliver better care, and improve clinical outcomes. And they seem like they could, but at the end of the day, are we really improving quality and lowering costs? Are we appropriately using the technology and avoiding medical legal risk? We won't know the answers to these questions unless we assess and evaluate our strategies and continuously look for ways to improve. The expansion of telehealth has the potential to create an integrated, digitally enabled system of care. Will we face challenges? Of course. For example, to create, truly create a network, we will eventually need the electronic medical records of this patient in Boston to communicate with the third party private company that were, I'm sorry, based in Texas that just facilitated a consult with a local subspecialist with the emergency room notes that were documented when the patient fell on a recent hiking trip in California. There's currently no standard interface amongst multiple electronic medical records. To be truly successful, we will need to identify the optimal, optimal way to integrate patient data within and across healthcare systems. But telehealth is well on its way to becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. With so many players in the marketplace, a solution will hopefully be right around the corner. Before we get too futuristic, let's get back to the here and now. Looking ahead, there will no doubt remain a strong role for traditional face-to-face -face doctor patient visits. These will not go away. Yet the fact of the matter is med much of medical decision-making is cognitive and there's a definite role for telehealth as well. Our goal should be to increase patient engagement because when patients are committed to their own healthcare goals, it eventually leads to lower costs and improved health overall. Ease of access to providers via telehealth helps patients maintain appointment and care schedules and makes it easier for them to reach out with questions. It reassures patients that their physicians are available and actively involved in their care. Luckily, these two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, if patients are seen virtually to start and it's decided that an in-person visit is required, these can still be scheduled. The future of medical care will undoubtedly require a synergistic combination of both modalities. And for each individual physician, the percent usage of each of these modalities may differ. As we capitalize on the telehealth momentum that has arisen through the COVID pandemic, we should set our sights on a grander vision. Instead of the traditional model of patients going to the doctor's office, imagine a world in which high quality, personalized, data-driven care is instead brought directly to the patient. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to, thanks to everyone who tuned into this webinar. Thank you, Denise. I appreciate that. It's always really cool to hear about what we've done, but where we could even take it.
and it does pose some interesting questions about um, crossing state lines and, and national health records. And I think there are some questions about it that we'll circle back to at the, at the end. Again, remember you can put your questions into the Q&A um, and I'll be sure to address them and, and pass them on to the panelists when we get to that point. Um, next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Mellinger. So take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, JB, and what a privilege to be part of this discussion tonight. Uh, really enjoyed the talks so far, and uh, we'll hope to add a little bit to that, reflecting on our motivation for how we work and teach. Uh, I want to uh, begin by just sharing a brief outline of what I'd like to cover in our conversation. I want to talk a little bit about how so much of what we do currently is focused on the what's or the technical aspects of what we do, and perhaps not enough on who we're becoming. This is especially important for our learners and those we're training, and has a lot to do, I think, with the burnout equation that we've been discussing. Secondly, I'd like to focus a little bit on the importance of meaning and purpose in our lives and how human motivation science teaches us that that's very important for complex cognitive work, such as we do as surgeons and is also a very important foundation of resilience. And then at the end, I'll just share a few personal lessons of the journey along the way, which I hope you can identify with. I'd like to begin by just uh, quoting a couple uh, modern thinkers, or relatively modern, uh, who highlighted that we're in an age where we are focusing a great deal on what we do, uh, but very little on who we're becoming and doing it. As you can see on the slide, Einstein said the proliferation of tools and the confusion of goals is characteristic of our age. And T.S. Eliot insightfully said that current human endeavor is oriented to finding a system of order so perfect we will not have to be good. I'm dating myself a bit, but I remember years ago, AT&T's slogan of uh, the system is the solution. And we approach many things that way. And indeed, systems help us. But they don't define who we are, and in tense and difficult times, who we are has a lot more to do with how we sustainably perform than just what we know how to do. As a program director, or I should say now recovering program director, uh, I've thought a lot in recent years about some of the pressures my faculty and my colleagues faced, and I've listed a few of them on this slide from a variety of sources, and we've come up with largely technical responses, but the end result has been both from a curricular standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, uh, a real a nightmare of added workload for those trying to invest themselves in the development of people, which is of course what uh, faculty do and what program directors do. And on top of all this, we have the fact that whereas a uh, hundred years ago or so, it took uh, roughly a century for medical knowledge to double, it's now estimated to be occurring at about an 18 month interval. So in the face of all that, we need solutions that aren't just technical, that aren't just uh, things we can glean from an expert about how to go about it, but that teach us what kind of people we need to be in order to go about it effectively. Perhaps you can identify with this image, which I think captures uh, how we've increasingly felt and John in his opening discussion of some of the pressures that have produced the burnout epidemic in medicine, I think uh, captured very well what some of the things in these boxes might be. I'd like to suggest that we go back to some pretty ancient sources that seem remarkably contemporary that again, this, the solution needs to get into the area of who we are and what kind of integrated personalities we are, not just how we're coping with new methods, new techniques, and new tools. Plato said many years ago, a cure of the part should not be attempted without treatment of the whole. No attempt should be made to cure the body without the soul. And if the head and body are to be healthy, you must begin curing the mind. For this is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body. The physicians first separated soul from body. And I would submit that Plato was right not only about how physicians behave towards their patients in his day, but perhaps how we're behaving towards ourselves in our own. 
Many of you have seen this quote before, but it highlights how important the inner world of our thought life is in forming uh, our activities, our actions, ultimately our character, and Emerson would carry it forward even to our destiny. So the importance of this inner world is not just uh, of great value for us, but also has implications for our learners. David Leach, who many of you will remember, was the head of the ACGME uh, within the past 10 to 15 years. In his exit interview, uh, said some really powerful things in this regard. And he highlighted that really what faculty do when we're in a teaching mode is we are representing uh, as a profession, as a statement of what is valuable, uh, the things that will help our learners orient their behavior. And we can all think of role models who helped us or perhaps hindered us in that effort. He said, we teach who we are. And although a resident's journey is full of external drama, which we obviously celebrate in TV shows, it actually proceeds from the inside out and is about character development. It's about a certain kind of person that the resident is becoming in the process of their formation professionally. He also highlighted that residents model behaviors and values in what they do, and they value faculty who, as he said, it live divided no more. That is, who are the integrated type of persons that Plato referred to, whose external behavior is consistently aligned with deeply held inner truths. The fact that our learners identify with these ideas uh, is highlighted in an editorial from uh, JAMA Internal Medicine uh, a little over two years ago now, where a transitional intern at Yale uh, wrote a very moving essay uh, highlighting sort of the difference between uh, the obituary and the eulogy. And he felt like his training was heavily oriented towards helping him populate his obituary, if you will, or what uh, he called Adam One, that achievement-oriented part of us that is reflected in a C, which Dr. Romanelli also already pointed out to us, our children don't find all that impressive. Uh, and that in the pursuit of the things that go on a CV, it is easy to lose track of the enriching growth endeavors that anchor us as people into something more meaningful and enduring. Uh, and it's really as we do those things in the pursuit of exercising, as he put it, our moral and virtuous profession as physicians, that we can cultivate our inner character and become the best version of ourselves, not only for us and importantly, not only for us, but for our patients. And that is this that brings meaning to our lives and to our work. Very profound statements from a junior learner. I'd like to, having reflected on those things that I think we neglect too often to our hurt, uh, talk a little bit now about how important this idea of purpose and meaning is to our motivation to do complex things. Many of you, of you have, will, have, will have read Daniel Pink's book on human motivation called Drive. Uh, there's a wonderful whiteboard YouTube video that only takes about 10 minutes to watch that summarizes it beautifully. And I'd encourage you to look at that if you don't have time to pick up the book. But Pink highlights business studies that showed that you really can't get higher performance out of people if their work involves any significant amount of cognitive effort by paying them more. But the three things that do make a difference, and his mnemonic is AMP, like AMP it up, are autonomy. Do you feel truly responsible for the outcome of whatever it is you're engaged in? Are you invested in it because it makes a difference and it belongs to you? Mastery, the sense that you actually could become better and better at this to the point where others would recognize the value of what you're doing and a progression to it that contributed greatly to uh, value in others' lives themselves. And purpose or meaning or personal significance. I've highlighted on this slide, and I won't spell them all out. Some of them have already been alluded to in the other presentations, particularly Dr. Romanelli's, but how some of the current milieu in medicine and surgery directly competes with these things that we know are important in meaningful human motivation for more complex work, such as we do as surgeons. I'd like to submit that this idea of meaning and purpose is, is really critical to our resilience. And it's part of an offensive strategy. I think so often in relation to these burnout themes, 
we take a defensive posture and we use various coping mechanisms, which as Dr. Romanelli pointed out, many, uh, many of those are dysfunctional for us. Uh, but there are offensive strategies we can use and we can learn these from those who've gone before and dealt with challenges, honestly, in some ways, quite a bit more challenging than our current international crisis. Uh, this book called Resilience by uh, Drs. Charney and Southwick. Uh, Dr. Charney is the dean at ICANN now uh, in New York City, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Dr. Southwick's at Yale. They did a lot of work with uh, PTSD victims and victims of extreme traumas, including landmine victims and uh, Vietnam Hanoi Hilton survivors. Uh, and they came up with a number of principles that they found resilient people who not only survived such settings, but actually thrived in and through them exhibited. I don't have time to go through them all, uh, but I have highlighted in bold print this idea of meaning and purpose, which ties into Pink's ideas and this idea of an integrated personality that we've been developing a bit in our conversation here. And I wanna just uh, go a little bit further into that, but you can see some of the others. Uh, that are critical uh, to people who, who thrive in difficult settings. And this idea of meaning, a couple quotes that illustrate its importance, and, and some of you will have read uh, the latter Viktor Frankl's book on man, man's search for meaning, but Nietzsche said, he who has a why can endure almost any how. And Frankl, based on his experience, both being uh, in a Nazi prison camp and also counseling many people both in the camp and afterwards in the post-war period, observed that people who had a reason to endure what they were going through uh, often did very well, but without that people, uh, even if they had other advantages, often didn't survive. He found in particular that uh, some of the prison camp victims, simply by pondering how important for it was for them to live so that they could tell the tale of what had happened and in a sense, defeat their captors by living through the experience and being whole for others on the other side. That simple sense of the purpose of their existence propelled them through what we would consider unspeakable challenges. And he made the comment, as is on the slide, that life is never made unbearable by circumstances. That's worth pondering a bit, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. So to close, I just wanted to offer a few personal reflections. Uh, not a lot of science in this talk, but perhaps some good reflective material uh, for us as busy people. I would first of all say uh, it's important to get the rocks right, as I put it on the slide. And that picture in the upper right corner highlights this. For those of you who haven't seen this metaphor, you can take a, a larger rock, smaller gravel, and sand and try to fit it into a jar. And what you find is that if you put the big things in first, then the medium-sized things and the sand last, it all fills in and everything fits. But if you put small things in first and leave the big important things, as it were in the metaphor, to last, it won't all fit. So learning to set priorities and to realize what's important and what's not in your life. And as, as others have already said, listening to what your children and your spouse and your close friends say can be very helpful in that regard. Secondly, know your restore points. We all have them, we all learn them or we wouldn't have got to a career in surgery in the first place, but we often abandon them in the busyness of our days and our lives. And that can be very costly for us. Whatever those things are, they often include physical things, spiritual things, uh, relational things. Uh, don't abandon those things as you become busy with your opportunities professionally. Third, focus on things that are timeless and relational. These are the things that last. Uh, focusing on the timeless keeps us from frittering away uh, the preciousness of life on things that have no ultimate value and we wouldn't want in our eulogy. And focusing on things that are relational keeps us from our temptation to self-absorption uh, and makes our lives a difference uh, in the world around us. Having a reflective habit, not abandoning a Sabbath principle or whatever you want to call it in your routine that allows you to step away. This, is, this has been shown to be a feature of genius across many disciplines. Many of these people have habits that take them outside their day-to-day -day pursuit and into a world where they can reflect on it and gain fresh ideas and fresh perspective. Uh, 
having a curricular view of life, especially in regard to your flaws, and I'll highlight in that regard the book on the bottom left, The Road to Character by David Brooks. If you haven't read it, it's a wonderful book about how many key people in history uh, formed character-wise uh, based on flaws they had to learn to manage. And that gives such curricular value to our day-to-day -day and even, uh, even our weaknesses. Uh, it can, again, it gives us meaning and purpose. And to build habits around those things so that they don't abandon us too easily uh, helps to establish them as a framework for our lives that lasts. And finally, much as we're doing tonight, and honestly, I would tell you quite on, uh, very much, this is what I've sound sages to be for me professionally, be part of a community of enduring meaning. Uh, don't let yourself be isolated, uh, but learn to appreciate uh, what others bring to you as a means of keeping yourself whole. I'll stop there. I again, greatly appreciate uh, the privilege of uh, being part of this webinar and look forward to the discussion and question time. Thank you. And, and thank you, John. I really appreciate um, your kind and insightful words as always. And uh, it is always difficult to get the rocks right, but it is always so positive and joy producing when you do. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of tidbits we can take from that that really allow us to put the rocks in our own lives in the right order so that we can find and continue to find the passion and the joy and the balance um, in our careers and in our lives personally. So I, um, Leanne, I don't know if you have anything else um, to add before we jump to the Q&A at all. I just want to um, thank all the speakers. I, I think there was uh, so many meaningful, uh, important takeaways. Um, and um, I'm just grateful for, for everybody for sharing their thoughts. I think uh, as we go to the Q&A, and, uh, and thanks for continuing to moderate that, um, you know, I might uh, uh, come back to ask all the panelists some of the, some of the things they're doing in uh, COVID that they really weren't doing before. I know there's some other questions and we're gonna to get to them, but maybe while we're doing those questions, um, some, of the, some of the things that, uh, you know, building on the, the, the forced, uh, you know, less work that we're doing, uh, maybe uh, doing these online meetings, meaning that we have more flexibility in that, and maybe we can just hear even maybe even from Dr. Asman and from uh, from everybody about some of the things they've been doing the last few weeks that um, are things that, like John told us, are, are things that they maybe went away from for for a long time and are able to come back to a little bit. Uh, so maybe we can circle back to that after uh, after the uh, Q and A. Okay, I'll just I'll remember to do that, and I'll just go down the line, and and we'll we'll, we'll each have an opportunity to share one thing, and it sounds great. Um, I'll try to do these questions uh, generally in the order of the participants. Forgive me if I mess that up. Um, but uh, speaking first to Dr. Romanelli, uh, regarding, and I'm going to paraphrase some of these questions. Do you feel that um, in addition to those things you highlighted in your talk? that medical legal issues, um, hospital policy issues, especially around COVID um, malpractice that may be related to COVID, do you feel that affects burnout or physician wellness as well? Definitely. In fact, I would argue um, that it was a big surprise to me in that survey that malpractice concerns didn't even come up on the list of reasons why people felt uh, negative feelings and, and things that pushed them towards burnout. Uh, I myself have experienced that early in my career. Um, I guess the one positive is the, in the United States, the federal government moved pretty aggressively to take malpractice largely off the table for COVID-19. Since we were all practicing in, in an environment of a lack of scientific evidence, um, there, are, there were no standards for care. So to try to hold physicians accountable to a standard of care when there was none developed was an insurmountable task. So I think we're largely protected from, from malpractice. But I do think we need to filter changes in our clinical practice spectrum through that prism of, of does it still meet the standard of care? So for example, 
would doing bariatric follow-up visits solely via telehealth still be the same standard of care as seeing them in the office? I'd say probably yes, but like Denise brought up, you can't incise and drain an abscess over a video call. So there's no substitute for the human-to-human -human interaction. So I do think malpractice concerns should not be ignored, but I don't think they should be the barrier to trying something new during this time of change. Sure. And to piggyback, just to ask these questions a little out of order, um, do you feel that just surgeon wellness, even to the extent of surgeon burnout and even subsequent to that, you know, moral or ethical injury associated with that burnout, do you feel that affects patients? Not just our delivery of care, but can, do you feel like that, that impacts the patients on the way we deliver care? Undeniably. And, and I think that should be our utmost concern aside from our own personal wellness and how it affects our, our families. But it does affect the delivery of patient care. That's been published many times over, over decades. And absolutely, yes, we need to worry about this. I think the reason why there's such alarmism around this issue is the fear of a decline in the delivery of patient care. All right, and so um, you presented a little bit about uh, burnout data. Is there a geographic distribution of burnout data? Is it way worse at Harvard than it is it's in Springfield, Mass, or is it, uh, is it different around the country? Uh, I don't know that that data was specified in the Medscape uh, report that came out. I, I think it's absolutely a question worthy of asking. Um, it sounds to me like it would be a phenomenal SAGES study to, to survey our membership and find out the answer to that question. But I, I don't know that I've seen that published, that there's a geographic different, measurable statistical difference in different regions. Okay. Uh, sort of the last one um, is, and before we get to Leanne's question is, um, do you feel that this type of moral injury or burnout also affects residents to what extent? And is there anything residents may do differently than say attending surgeons might do for wellness? So I absolutely 1000% agree with what Dr. Mellinger said, which is that we, the residents model themselves after us. And so how we cope with the negative drivers, the negative influences that drive us towards non-wellness is being watched very carefully by our residents. And when we do something positively, they see it. And when we do something negatively, they see it. So um, to, to kind of give a vague answer to the question, you know, we're negatively influencing our residents when we're burning out. And, and so, and, and they're arriving there faster because they've seen it happen. I'd like to think they learn lessons and, and make positive changes based on our bad decisions. But we know from our, our educational methodology in, in clinical medicine, that's really not the case. Um, they model their behavior after us. And so we're actually influencing the next generation of physicians negatively, and we need to be very cognizant of this issue. And then just to reiterate Leanne's question before I, I jump to Denise, um, what one cool or different or unique thing have you done within your practice during this period? And what cool, fun or unique thing have you done outside of work that's given you some joy? Um, as far as inside the practice, we have begun to use telehealth for the first time, not to keep repeating the same thing. This was totally new to me. Um, we've just started on video telehealth and my endocrine surgery partner has, was in the middle of piloting it when the pandemic hit. And we're rolling that out across our practice. What I'm trying to do is break the traditional model of those visits ha having to happen on a specified day at a specified time. Um, I really wanna look at a model where we can do two or three telehealth visits in between OR cases and effectively free up large chunks of time where traditionally we're tied to our clinic or office setting. Um, I think we need to work smarter and this would be an example of being more efficient using our downtime to get other clinical work done. Uh, as far as on the fun side, uh, I've been not only playing music with uh, a gastroenterology partner of mine and fellow SAGES member, uh, but I've been writing music and I actually wrote a new song called Social Distance. So uh, I, I, I've been playing and writing music and getting that creative energy has definitely helped me maintain sanity during these uncertain times. I, I'm sure there's a way we can release that internationally at the end of the webinar, your new song. <laughs> I'm sure there's a way. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Thank you for that. Um, Denise, you're up next. So, um, 
as it stands, physicians most often, unless you practice in a, in a veterans affairs health system, have to have license to practice in individual states. So how do you see that affecting the model of sort of nationwide telehealth in the future? Um, and is there any way around that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, all of these things are changing as we speak, right? I mean, three months ago, half the things that we're doing now or more, we never would have expected would have happened. And so I think we just need to think outside of what we've been used to up until now. And so, I mean, for us right now, where I am in Boston, we can be licensed. We've done kind of emergency licensing in local um, states near, around us. But I think ultimately we just have to think differently. Um, and a lot of the things that right now, you know, are state regulated versus federal regulated versus private insurer regulated, I think we just need to throw all of that kind of traditional way of thinking out the window and, and reinvent this to make it really work. Sure, outside of the box. Yeah. Um, one of the things that obviously your job is involved with is training residents. And so what would you think is the impact on their, specifically on their surgical skills training, um, given the decreased operative volume? And what might you recommend during these difficult times that residents could do as far as continuing to maintain their surgical skills? Great question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the, we do a lot of simulation, a lot of simulation, um, we have materials, kind of like, you know, for a lot of the activities that my children have, they can send you a box of materials and then you, you know, click on to a live session via YouTube or Zoom or whatnot, and you learn how to put something together or whatnot. And so I think um, there's a lot of ways, again, to reinvent traditional ways of educating residents. Um, and so we've looked at ways in which we could offer intern boot camp virtually. Um, where we offer, you know, a series of um, lectures, videos, et cetera, that um, our incoming interns can access. Um, and then in addition to that, certain skills we either are doing in a socially distant fashion in person, um, or we're thinking of kind of uh, innovative ways where they could practice uh, suturing with some education in, a, in the form of a video or a live lecture, um, and then have the materials that they can practice on their own. And just to piggyback that question, since the technology is already available, say for robotics, for instance, to do sort of teleproctoring um, beyond one console in one state and help someone operate in another state, we currently don't use it because of all the laws and, and other issues. But do you see things like current and future technologies enabling us to be able to do that? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think we've all in the last few months realized that for all the times that we had to fly across the country to meet at the airport uh, Hilton in Chicago, um, that we actually could just be sitting in our offices or our homes and do a Zoom um, visit and it works actually quite well. So I think that there are a lot of ways that um, in the future telementoring, I know Sages has done a lot of um, groundbreaking work in this area, but telementoring and, and using uh, not letting geographic distance limit us is really the key of the future. And I think if nothing else, the last couple of months have taught us that. Okay, just a few more and then I'll be all done firing questions at you. Um, so one um, individual asked about informed consent associated with telehealth and what is required with regard to informed consent and how do you do it? Yeah, that's a great question. So informed consent, you know, you could do it right now and have someone on the phone with you. That's how our institution um, allows it. So if you're informing consent over the phone, if you have somebody else on the line. Um, the other way that we're getting around is you have to meet the patient before your operation. So we go through, we actually can give a fuller, more thorough consent, sometimes via Zoom with slides and um, spend a little extra time, you know, diagramming things out. Um, and then having them sign the consent actually at the right before the operation. Okay. And then sort of another future question just to hit on that, because it's always fun and exciting, is how do you think um, patient monitoring, if you will, patient reminders, um, you know, the ability for patient data to be fed back into a, an electronic health record, for instance, will impact the rise and or fall of telehealth? 
I think none of these facets that all kind of fall under the heading of telehealth, I don't think anything is mutually exclusive. And I think they all are kind of tools in the armamentarium. They all augment one another and they're all synergistic. So, you know, I think that there um, will always be a role for in-person visits. There will always be a role to just get on a video visit and talk to your patients and explain something because they want that reassurance of seeing you, um, you know, face to face. Um, but I definitely think that there are things that can more easily, instead of checking for, you know, arrhythmias or checking to see if someone that you've sent home after surgery, whether or not they're having pain or a wound infection or whatnot, I think a lot of that you could do through um, connected devices, uh, remote monitoring, et cetera. So I think it all works. I think the concept that we need to have is a system of care that has all these different parts in it and none of it is um, mutually exclusive. Okay. Last one, just because I have to ask this one. Um, will the HIPAA waiver continue for telehealth? And um, since other apps like FaceTime and Duaro are easily accessible um, and, and things like EMR sponsored telehealth are more difficult to access, do you think we'll see a shift in the types of platforms we use? Yeah, I definitely think so. So, you know, I read something interesting where they were talking about HIPAA, which came out like in the mid 1990s, and a lot of the a little bit more archaic of rules um, with regards to, you know, what had to be, what constituted HIPAA compliance. And in actuality, it's been decades later and there's so much new technology, end-to-end um, -end encryption. I mean, all these, a lot of these um, texting um, platforms and, and other platforms that are commercially available have a very high degree of security. And so I think it's just not covered under the um, older HIPAA regulations. So I think there's definitely a role for us to look outside of um, the traditional EMR-based uh, video visits or, or, or uh, security and look towards these new technologies. I mean, look at Zoom, right? Or Doximity. I mean, all of these are kind of third-party private um, uh, technologies that are now in this space and quite secure. All right. Now, one cool thing you've had to do other than work. So the cool thing other than work really has been, um, I, I would say I, I'm a pretty glass half full person. So I don't know that I've been burnt out or I mean, I still love the job and everything. So I've been a pretty happy person, but I think what's really been nice about the um, slowing down is just enjoying the simple things. And so, you know, without um, anything fancy, there's nowhere to go. So taking walks with my family, going on bike rides, um, putting together a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, I don't know when the last time, you know, I, I didn't even know I would like jigsaw puzzles, but, you know, just to sit and talk to one another and spend some time doing that um, has been really nice. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, JB. And, and, and John, I'll just do you last and I'll start with the last question first. So what cool and unique thing have you done in your work life and Probably more importantly, what cool and unique thing have you done with your family or in your personal life? In my personal life, uh, I've gone for a daily walk, I think for over a month now, most of it with my wife. And even when we were dating, I don't think we did that. Uh, so that's been really special. Um, I've had more time to read, uh, especially reflective reading, and a little more time, at least FaceTiming with grandkids. Uh, so that's all been great. Uh, and in terms of work, um, one of the things uh, I'm part of now is a, a sort of a leadership development uh, arm of what the institution is doing. And one of the things uh, we did was uh, came up with a weekly uh, newsletter um, that the person I work for in that capacity uh, developed. And we write little reflective pieces in it. They're short enough, they don't take a lot of work, but they do force you to put your heart in a certain place. So we were writing about things like vulnerability and humility and how do you learn from a season of lament in life in a way that makes you more effective in what you do. And we don't usually think about those kind of things. Um, so that's been really both fun and uh, a good learning exercise for me. Well, it was one of us. Um, how about, uh, I'm not sure how much time, time we have left, but how about one good non-work-related book you're reading? 
Oh, let's see. I love biography. Um, and uh, this isn't biography, but it's by one of my favorite biographers, David McCullough. And he wrote a book uh, called The Pioneers. Uh, I grew up in Ohio mostly, and it's really about the settlers of Ohio, beginning with Marietta. And it's not about, with a couple exceptions of characters that come into the story, it's not about people that you would normally uh, learn about. Uh, but as he got into it, there's just remarkable character lessons and other illustrations about well, what went into the development of, of that part of the country, and including how it played into the whole pre-Civil War slave debate. So that was, that was a fun read. He's a good author. Cool. Very cool. Um, well, I guess since Leanne asked the question, I'll, I'll answer her question as well, and then that'll be it for the questions that, um, that we have. But um, I think for me, one of the cool work things is that I have found in, in some interesting way, a real connection with patients that uh, through telehealth that I might have otherwise not have had. So I think because the patient feels at ease and I'm you know, wearing a backwards baseball cap and a t-shirt while I'm interviewing them many times and it's, it's, it's a very personal one-on-one -on -one exchange even if we aren't present for one another physically. Um, I've had patients show me their refrigerator to tell me what they're eating. Um, I've had patients introduce me to family members I wouldn't have otherwise met um, because they feel very comfortable. And I think that's been a really cool and rewarding thing. And it's been uplifting. Whereas before I would have been, you know, on the clock and trying to get done in, in 10 minutes and move on. So I think that's been a very positive work experience. Um, and socially, uh, I have learned to play Roblox with my kids. Um, and so now my son can call me largely at any time of day for the most part, which he only could not do and ask to play 15 minutes of, uh, of video games with me, um, sort of in a, in a televideo fashion. And so that's been a cool and unique bonding experience for me. And, and I think that'll be something that I'll purposely continue moving forward, even if we do go back to a more traditional approach, or at least in part to a more traditional approach. So that's my answer. Um, and, and Leanne, I'll turn it back over to you and Horacio. Well, that's great. JB, you've done a masterful job in, uh, in moderating this evening. I think the talks were uh, wonderful, inspiring. I think I'm going to watch them again on the recording at some point. Uh, uh, I think you have a great reading list from uh, Dr. Mellinger of, uh, of, uh, of a bunch of books there that I scribbled down uh, for the remaining of your COVID time. Uh, for me, one of the things that I think COVID has, one of the lessons of COVID is is that just in terms of when, when you know, by not being able to operate and, and for having it at every time I've operated in the last three months, it's been, it's been such a joy and a pleasure. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the reset is, uh, is to remember that feeling of being in the operating room and that it's a huge privilege to be able to, um, and that we owe to our mentors and our teachers who, who taught us and to our patients that we're able to, to have that skill set and, and bring it to people and work with, with teams that are uh, willing to put their own safety uh, on the side and, uh, and come to work every day. And I think that sometimes, me, for me personally, I kind of forget it. You forgot, forgot it and um, you know, even uh, in the middle of the night when you don't have to do it every night, it's definitely what John said. I mean, when you do it uh, and, and it's fresh and it's new and uh, it, it doesn't take long for that reset to happen. It happened very quickly. Um, and I'm just going to try to to remember that uh, when when we go uh, back into uh, back into the into the into the incredibly uh, hectic pace that 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 we have. And, and sometimes I can't even believe that the hectic pace we were on, the time of day I would wake up in the morning, the uh, what I would do on the weekends, the traveling, like uh, Denise said. Um, just for, you know, to travel all day for, you know, a couple hour meeting. Um, you know, hopefully we, we take those away, human nature being what it is, we, we probably will forget all this stuff pretty quick. Uh, but maybe activities like this, recording it, writing down our feelings, reflecting on them, uh, on our lessons are, are the things that will help us, uh, or, or journaling or uh, talking to other people and uh, so we can remind each other uh, of, of some of the really important reset. I think that word is, is, is a great word for this. 
the reset and the lessons that hopefully we'll take forward uh, to be happier, to be happier at work and happier at home. Uh, Horacio, can I give you the last word to close it out for us? Um, yes, I, I have five minutes. Then let me tell you also my impressions of about the COVID. I think we all have learned interesting things. I mean, I, I echo what everybody has said about learning to enjoy. I mean, uh, uh, John was saying I slept uh, an hour more than every day. Uh, it's incredible what sleeping does. I had forgotten. Um, and it is incredible to sleep seven hours a day and, and that's great. Um, I also learned from our colleagues. I learned um, that, uh, and, and I have said this before, that you know it's okay to be fearful that we need to honor the the feeling when we go and we especially at the peak times and we were concerned that we would be seeing or operating on a patient that has COVID, but that doesn't mean that we don't have courage and then um, uh, as i said before courage and fear can be together and i saw that in a lot of our college colleagues that were deployed to the front lines and and that encouraged me the thing that i have liked the most professionally I felt that finally the world has turned back and realized what we do again. That we're not just these soap operas on TV. I mean, when you see people all over the world at some time in the evening coming out to the balconies and clapping for us, that was very encouraging. And we have seen that in, in different ways. Um, personal thing of job that I have done, a lot of things that were good, even though I've been extremely busy, but uh, somehow you find ways. It's just to bike ride in Coral Gables, particularly sneak into a um, golf course. I'm not gonna name the hotel because they would probably put me, arrest me, but every night I found a back way to sneak into a golf course when everything was closed and look at the sunset. Um, I did that three or four times a week. Now the golf courses are open, I cannot go anymore. Then I enjoy that. Um, I just wanna close by saying, we heard a lot about all the, the, the heavy weight the, that have produced um, the, um, burnout. I just wanna propose to you, we have much more control than what we think we do. No one can go inside the operating room and do what we do. Any other job, any other subspecialty, any other administrative position almost can be done if you find a good replacement. But surgeons, what happens in the operating room, no one else can do it. Then let's, let's gradually start to incorporate in that. Somehow they have washed our brains and made us forget that. But we do have control. Among the things that they have said, I think that the most important thing is the loss of control is what affects us the most. Then let's remember that as we embark into going back to our normal activities, and hopefully this task force at SAGES is going to remind us of that every often, every so often. And we're going to be able to find out ways to regain control. Regain control about not being overloaded with everything that we dislike, within reason, of course. And regaining control about flexibility of schedule. I mean, we all have talked today about the different things that, that we have learned. And uh, definitely, I think we can do it. Let's just try to do it. Let's not forget about that. And I'm going to stop there. Okay, so have a great night, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Thank you.